You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here with Mr. Brett Newcomb. And I am glad to be here. Yeah. Are you, do you want to talk about your trip? No. Okay. <laughs> Too short. Ready to go again. It was a month. Too short. Ready to yeah. go again. Yeah. The time telescope is catching me. You know, I'm old. The time telescope? Oh. Yeah. What, what, is there a well, the Y-intercept? Edge, the edge, edge of the cliff is out there somewhere closer than that's, was. That's the Y-intercept yeah. is, the, is the, when you hit the edge of the cliff? One has to be realistic. Uh, yeah, I don't like to hear you talk like that. Whistling in the graveyard. Yeah. Well, but it, it, suffice it to say that you had a good time. Oh, I had a great time. Good. Good. Um, and I had a great time watching the weather forecast from St. Louis while I was gone. Well, I was going to mention Now it. that I've come home, it's same old, same old. Mm-hmm. So your goal is to try and spend time away from St. Louis for the winter. In the sun and on the beach. Yeah. I, my wife and I were discussing this. I've, I've managed to walk the beaches of uh, four of the five Great Lakes, the Great Salt Lake, uh, two oceans, and six of the world seas. So I'm well on my way to going to all the places I want to go. That's pretty freaking amazing. Yeah, it's a, for a boy from Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I walked when I was a child was the banks of the Arkansas River. Made good. Yeah. So I got away. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes that's the trick. Is yeah, yeah getting away. Well, um, as they say in AA, you know, the geographical cure. Yeah. If I discovered the same truth that you learn in AA, wherever you go, there you there are. you are. Yeah. Yep, you take yourself with you. Yep. So uh, one of the things that I am keenly aware of is that our friendship started 25 years ago because you were looking to practice being a good friend. Do you remember that? <laughs> so one of the challenges in my life uh, that I have received from putative friends is they say well you're not a good friend and i said what do you mean by that if you need me i'm there well yeah if i need you you're here but you don't ever reach out to me in the way that i want you to I said, what do you mean well you don't call me and say hi you don't call me and say let's go to dinner you don't call me and say i have to call you and i said yeah it works really well for me <laughs> So I listen to that, and periodically I make uh, moves to Mm -hmm. try to accommodate what I'm hearing to the degree that I can. And it's a challenge for me. Uh, And I'm not real sure how to articulate why that is so, but it is. Mm -hmm. And when you were a student of mine 25, 27 years ago, I liked your performance as a student in my class. I thought you were genuine and intelligent and well-read and oh. somebody that I would could uh, spend more time with. So I stopped you at the end of class and said, you want to go get coffee sometime? And you're like, no, we can't do that. You're a professor. I'm a student. Uh, it's not ethical. And I said, well, you're not going to be my student anymore, so we'll see. Of course, I didn't realize at the time that you weren't going to turn in your work. And I was going to have to give you an incomplete that would stretch out for another three or four years. Uh, so you were you actually were foreshadowing something I should have listened to and said, no, I can't go to coffee or be your friend. Well, it, it, it yes, in, in retrospect, hindsight being twenty twenty, it probably would have been to your benefit not to have engaged in that initially. But uh, in the end, I think it's turned out okay. Well, the jury's still out. Yeah. But it's lasted this long. It's lasted I've this had, long. I've had marriages that didn't last this long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, I remember you saying to me, okay, let me, let me start a different way. My experience of this was that we got into this and I was looking for, without at the time knowing it, 
a surrogate father figure and a at least a a mentor yeah and i like friendships based on that power dynamic where i'm the one in charge <laughs> sure you do um, <laughs> those are more fun for me than the other kind and and early in in our 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 friendship beyond being professor and student you had said to me you know a part of why i am investing in this is i want to try and practice being a better friend and it was at the time that was really hard for me to hear because i still was in the mentor mentee thing but i remember we were in a meeting at west county psychological associates when we both worked there and after the meeting you and i were talking and i was saying you know i see you as a mentor and 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 i don't remember what had happened in the meeting but we were having this conversation and you said to me, but I need you to be my friend. Hmm. And that was the point at which for me that the, the situation changed. And I no longer saw us in that mentor-mentee dynamic and started to see us more as friends. And now, you know, that has been, like I said, 25, 27 years ago. And I... I think that that's grown. I think it's become deeper. But one of the things that you sent me an article about making friends as you get older. Yeah. And it really, it struck me because I started thinking about, you know, now at almost 60, how many friends do I have? How do I feel about those friendships? Do I invest in those friendships? And if I were going to go out and try and make friends if we as we come out of the pandemic at my age what would that look like and so it really was a very existential kind of evaluation for me it also requires a definition of terms okay what, what does one mean when one says mm, mm -hmm. be my friend or i want a friend or i have friends i have a lot of friends there are circles of intensity circles of friendship and you say well I, i've got i'm friends with everybody in my neighborhood uh, what does that mean? It right. means that when I see them, I recognize, oh, they live in my neighborhood. It means when I see them, I say, oh, hi, how are you? Uh, going back to uh, uh, Eric Burns' stroke rituals, mm -hmm. uh, what's the nature of our relationship? Is it a two-stroke ritual, a four-stroke ritual, a ten-stroke ritual? Uh, going back to the idea that being a good person, if I see that you're struggling to carry your groceries in the house, do I offer to help? Mm -hmm. Or if I see... Uh, guy across the street from me a tree limb blew down and he was cutting it up with a chainsaw and stacking it and i went over and helped him do that mm -hmm. and we didn't know each other and he's like well i know you live down the street but you know what are you doing this for and i said well it's thought you needed help mm -hmm. uh, does that make us friends mm -hmm. no but it offers offers an opportunity for a contact that could become a friendship mm -hmm. uh, and it offers an opportunity for contact that just sees you as more than a, a, a sack full of clothes filled with a body and you know, walking down the street. I, I wonder who that person is. I know mm -hmm. the person lives around here, but I don't know anything about them. Um, so what are you looking for? What needs does that meet? And, and in today's world, especially with the pandemic, changing the work environment so that so many people are working from home. Mm-hmm. What the article was talking about is once you have left structured environments like school, mm -hmm. your opportunity for meeting people is somewhat limited mm -hmm. to your work environment uh, and your social activities. So how do you make... If you engage in social activities. And so how do you make use of those opportunities? Uh, church, community activities, uh, bridge club, book club, whatever. How do you meet people, and is it of value? And then I started thinking about it after I read the article. I was thinking about in the years that I was a therapist, seeing recently divorced men or recently widowed men of a certain age mm -hmm. who said, how, how, how am I going to survive? My wife was the social glue mm -hmm. for me. She's the one that invited people to dinner. She's the one that made contacts in the neighborhood. She went to the girls' coffee club. You know, I went to work and came home. And so she's not here to do that anymore. She died or she left me. So now I'm alone in ways I've never been alone before. And I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And 
than I was looking at. I have a, a son who's in his mid twenties, and he and some of the friends that he grew up with in a similar age have all graduated from college or didn't go to college and went out and got jobs somewhere. And so I'm concerned uh, and have shared this concern with him. What are your friendship prospects? Mm -hmm. What are your relationships? How do you make friends? And this article just really uh, kind of addressed mm -hmm. all those questions. So I said to you, I think, I think we should talk about it. So the, the one thing that the article doesn't address that I really ended up finding myself focusing on, mm. or at least spending some time thinking about, was the idea of social media and what is the relevance of social media for social interaction. Are those friendships? Because I remember when my son, you know, years ago, started getting on AOL online, yeah. which was, you know, this was yeah. even before there were cell Coming phones. And, away, texting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. and, and he would say to me, Oh, these people are my friends. Right. And I'd say, and, and, and I required him to be able to confirm for me that this was a real person that he knew. And you know, that, that, that we could somehow verify and corroborate this information. But you know, he was telling me, Oh, I can be friends with people from Australia. Yeah. I can be friends with people from China, which was exciting in the beginning of the internet to think, wow, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, as a young man, you would have had opportunities to develop pen pal relationships mm -hmm. around the world. And a lot of schools and churches, a lot of classes promoted that. Let's, let's our classroom bond with a classroom full of Japanese students in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And we'll all be pen pals and write back and forth to each other. Maybe develop a lifetime relationship. So I remember being in school and having that be an assignment. Write, write a letter to somebody and they gave mm -hmm. me a, an address. A uh, couple of letters go back and forth and then nothing ever came from that. But with the internet exploding... Then it, there was an opportunity. I, my son, Spencer, did the same thing. I came in one day, and he was playing video games. I'm like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm playing with my friend in Germany. Right. I'm like, you've never been to Germany. You don't have any Germans. <laughs> oh, I do. I have a friend in Germany. So, yeah. I know lots of people, old man. Yeah. So that, that became a possibility. So, but, but do you think that is that a is that what you would consider if you only know somebody through the context of your interaction with them on social media, whether that's Facebook or yeah. online gaming, whatever, do you think that's a friendship? No. Okay. It's an acquaintanceship, yeah. but uh, again, we throw that word friend around rather loosely. Exactly. There are levels of acquaintanceship. There are levels of intensity of awareness and communication and connection. Right. And so I have some A friends, some B friends, some C friends. Uh, in categories based on the intensity of the connection mm -hmm. and the uh, intensity of the emotional sharing that has occurred. Well, and but you had started by saying we need to define the terms. Yeah. And then, so you have people in your environment, like in your neighborhood, yeah. that you'll say hi to. That's more of an acquaintance. Yeah. And and you would put the social media people. I that have you, a flow chart on my bedroom walls, A, a yeah. list, B list, C uh -huh. list. And so if I get a call from somebody, I have to go look and see which list they're on. So I know how to answer the phone. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Because you've got caller ID, so you know who I know who's calling. I mean, if I don't know who's calling, I don't answer. Are you, are you going to tell me where I am on the list? You're there. <laughs> I'm on the list. You're on the list. Well, I'm on the list. So, hey, that's that's actually pretty <laughs> you good. You made the list. I'm glad I'm on yeah. the list. Uh, but I think that, especially during the pandemic, that a lot of us have assumed or possibly been deluded into believing that these kinds of social connections that we make in the ether of the internets are legitimate friendships. And I've even read psychological treaties on whether or not this is an actual friendship. And my concern is that a part of being in an interactive friendship is learning social cueing and nonverbal behavior and things like that, that that's a part of the human experience that doesn't exist if you only have these electronic interactions. So one of my goals in life has always been to have friends in disparate 
social status mm-hmm. circles. Mm-hmm. Rich friends, poor friends, educated friends, uneducated friends, laboring friends, professional friends. Because I like a mix of groups mm-hmm. and of being accepted by or among within disparate groups. So I've always tried to facilitate that and seek it out. Uh, I have, you and I have a friend who is very important to both of us. And we've known for a number of years. That particular friend was saying to me just recently, I don't have very many friends. I don't want very many. Mm-hmm. I have two or three people that I would call my friend. I have a lot of acquaintances. I have mm-hmm. a lot of people in the community or church with whom I am social and nice and care, but I wouldn't call him a friend. So mm-hmm. his, his definition of friendship is much more intensely intimate mm-hmm. than mine would be. Uh, he teared up and he said, and you're, you're on the list of mm-hmm. one or two, which made me tear up. Uh, that's important to me that he feels that way about my relationship. So then you go look in the mirror. Is that the way I have relationships? Is mm-hmm. that the way that I have friendships? Uh, and, and my answer is no. I, I have different definition of terms. I have different procedures. But I, in reading this article, there were things globally that I think we should talk about, mm-hmm. especially in an age of isolation and loneliness like we have with the pandemic and, and so many people having to work from home. And yeah. real questions about will they ever go back to the office environment? Right. And, and if so, at what level? And I've always maintained, and when I used to teach sociology and anthropology, I, I would give lessons or lectures about it you change relationships throughout your life like you change clothes mm-hmm. so when you're in high school and you have all these best friends in high school they're going to be best friends forever mm-hmm. it's hard to realize that mm-hmm. within five years you aren't going to know any of those mm-hmm. people and if you're lucky maybe one or two of them you will still know 30 years down the road but they're all going to move on mm-hmm. they're going to make other connections so then you go off to college and you make college friends and really good friends, close friends. And you think, well, uh, you even get married. You say, well, I'm going to be with this person for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And 20 years down the road, you're not with that person right. anymore. And 30 years down the road, you don't know what they're doing or where they live or if they're alive or whatever. I mean, the, the rotation occurs and those connections dissolve. And then you have to make new ones mm-hmm. or you have none. Mm-hmm. And so as you age as you are an adult, are there things that you can think about, Mm -hmm. can know, that improve your chances of making connections with new friends? Whether it's as a result of an emotional trauma, my wife dies, Mm -hmm. I got divorced, I lost my job, I moved to a new town, I know no one. How do I become known? How do I become connected? How do I become anchored among a group of people that I care about? How do I create caring about somebody? Yeah. So this article talks about things. So let's take our break. And when we come back from the break, we'll actually focus on those things. Would that it were so. (laughs) You know, if you've gotten this far into the show, then obviously you find the show to be worthwhile, beneficial, maybe even helpful. And so I just wanted to say, uh, if you've gotten this far into the show, and you want to help us out, even if you don't want to help us out, just do it anyway, go to (laughs) Apple Podcasts and rate us and leave a review. That is super helpful. Subscribe to the show on YouTube and hit the bell icon so that you get notifications when new shows drop. That stuff is really, really helpful for us. And I know that Mr. Brett agrees. Absolutely. Reviews are positive. Uh, Positive reviews are more positive, but (laughs) negative ones are as well because it helps you uh, decide what how to focus and how to how whatever you're attending to say is being heard and the secret so, is the algorithm doesn't care whether the review is positive or negative as our friend Mike Norton says regularly feedback is a gift if it's Friday it's psych with Mike okay we're back and uh, so I think that we're both agreeing that these connections are important. They're important for psychological health, for emotional health, but the more and more that we learn about loneliness and the negative effects of that, they're important for physical health. So even survival Yeah. in in the pandemic era, we've been recommending if you know somebody that lives alone, Mm -hmm. reach out to them, especially 
older people who might have health issues, reach out and say, do you need anything in the grocery store? Reach out and say, can I get your trash can this morning because the trash is coming? Mm -hmm. Or or can you handle it? Uh, Do that. So this article that we're talking about suggests that you you need to understand that friendships are Mm non-organic generally. And that they are the result of an exposure effect, or what they. In the- and so, when you say non-organic, that means that they're just not going to happen by chance and then just bloom and grow. You have to actually invest some effort. You have to plant a seed. You have to water it, nurture it. You have to fertilize it, give it give it enough crap, uh, and work it. You mm-hmm. have to work the soil of the relationship. And so they said that the uh, the exposure effect is a critical ingredient and, and same thing in terms of falling in love you know mm-hmm. one of the theories you know we used to, to debate this in high school and college but the theory of of is there one person in the world that mm-hmm. god has identified as your soulmate that you have a responsibility to defend I and mean, there are nine billion people in the world you're born in kentucky frankfurt kentucky what if your soulmate that God created mm-hmm. for you as a perfect match lives in New Delhi, India? Mm-hmm. How are you going to find them? Mm-hmm. So an alternative theory to that one person soulmate idea is proximity. Yeah. You know, if you can't be with the one you love, love or the one, the one you're, you're supposed to love, love the one you're with. Uh, how do you make that happen? How do you find any of those people? Mm-hmm. And if you look back over your lifetime, that's exactly what did happen. You You met boys or girls in high school you got attracted you dated you went steady you mm-hmm. got promised you got engaged some of you got married some of those relationships last a lifetime i know somebody that's been married 60 plus years mm-hmm. most of them don't but the way that they last yeah is based on as you say this idea of proximity or of consistency so you know we if you're watching TV, you're watching right. stuff, and and people say, oh yeah, I used to have this really good friend or this really good relationship, and then you know we got in a fight, and then we the show didn't talk canceled. to each other, <laughs> yeah. and then you know now we don't even know each other, yeah. and and that's because nobody followed through, nobody followed up, nobody made the effort, and so what the article was saying is that it's really important. So first off, you should assume that people like you. Don't assume that you're you know, somehow a, a pariah and that, that you're out on an island by yourself and that you have to take the initiative, but then you have to follow up. And sometimes following up means that you have to reach out after there's been something that's happened to cause a break or cause a, a roadblock in the relationship. And I think that's hard for people. You also have to accept and respect the choices of others. Mm-hmm. So if someone chooses not you, mm-hmm. there's a point at which you have to say, okay, you don't want to be my friend. Yeah. So I've made whatever passes at this that I'm willing to make. You are rejecting those. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't mean I can't have friends. Mm-hmm. It means I can't have you for my friend. Mm-hmm. So I need to move on. Mm-hmm. And so... When you find, as a, as a clinician, and you get a client that comes in that is feeling alone and is struggling with these issues, you have to gently investigate with them their self-perception mm-hmm. about their social approachability and their social skills. You know, if it's some visibly obvious thing, like you have body odor or you have an uh, affected mannerism that is irritating as hell, how do you invite a discussion of those? Mm-hmm. And what we're trained as clinicians is that whatever happens in the microcosm of that session happens in their real life, what they bring to the table to interact with you. So if they're doing something that makes you crazy as mm-hmm. the clinician, you have to find a way to put it on the table as a discussion point without it being a judgmental accusation. Right. So you have to say, I, I need to share with you that I am distracted because as you tap your pencil on the mm-hmm. pad, it's getting on my nerves and it's it's limiting my availability to you. I'm pulling, mm-hmm. I'm pulling back and I know that I'm doing that and I don't want to. Uh, and I have to wonder, does this ever happen to you in other relationships? Mm-hmm. And if, if so, how would you know? What do you look for? What are the nonverbal cues that tell you I've suddenly backed away from you? Mm-hmm. I've put some distance there. Can you 
can you learn to recognize those? And then given the option that you want to, can you make a different choice? Or can you say, is, is this bothering you when I do this? Because mm-hmm. <laughs> it seems to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you try to have those conversations to make people aware of their process and their skills mm-hmm. and also of their issues in this area. These things are socially normal, normalized, acceptable. Are you able to do those things? Are you able to embrace those things? Uh, and then the if I, if I was raised in a really dysfunctional family, uh, I may have been given messages as a child that I was not approachable, I was not likable, I had to earn the right to be liked or to be accepted. And so I grew up learning the way you make friends is you sell yourself to a friend. Let me be there for you, let me take care of you, let me do this for you. How do we distinguish that purchasing behavior from the giving and sharing of a real friendship? Mm -hmm. Can can we have that conversation? and so, if someone says, I, I want to be your friend, I don't like you, and, or, or what if things ebb and flow? You know, like right now, there's a huge political divide in America yeah. between the right and the left. Do I have friends on the opposite side? Mm-hmm. In being friends with that person, can I trust the relationship? Or is there a point at which they look at me and say, you're a pariah. Yeah. You, you're not anything I believe. But to be able to do that, there has to be reciprocity. So you have to want to be that person's friend. But that other person has to want making. I have to decide whether or not I can be your friend if, if my being your friend requires complete melding of our belief system. If, if I believe... Uh, okay. So I was assuming that we're not going to agree and we both have to agree to disagree. Yes. And, and I still, think that that's hard. But yeah. still respectfully yeah. care for one yeah. another. And trust one another. Mm-hmm. I have friends who politically are on the other end of the spectrum that could call me at midnight and say, I need to go to the hospital. I'd take them mm-hmm. and happily mm-hmm. in, a, in a heartbeat. Uh, and I, and I'm, I would like to project that I'm open to having discussions about why we disagree about politics mm-hmm. or religion or morality or anything else. Because I think educated people should be able to do that. Mm-hmm. That's a conceit of mine. Some of my friends are less conceited, yeah, well, and less I, willing to have those conversations. And we've done, you know, a couple of shows on this. I would actually say that's about psychological flexibility. So people who are psychologically yeah. flexible have the ability to agree to disagree and still have their own beliefs and allow the other person to have their beliefs. Well, I come from the premise that I'm attractive, flexible, and smart, and so mm-hmm. you're going to want to be my friend. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you may be the more psychologically flexible person in a relationship. So you may have to own more well, My wife says sometimes I'm pretty damn rigid and that I create the disconnect. And, and so she may be oh, she's more psychologically right. flexible than you in your guys' relationship. That would be a requirement for her, yes. But there are relationships, I know there are relationships that you have where you are the more psychologically flexible person. I would like to think so. So that's, you know, that's a spectrum, but you have to recognize if you're going to be in friendships, in relationships at all, that sometimes you may be the more psychologically flexible person and that's okay. You don't have to end a friendship because you say this other person is less psychologically flexible. But you may need to be selective. Like I have a friend okay. that I like in one group of people, yeah. the way that person presents himself, mm-hmm. and I don't like that person in another group of people. Mm-hmm. I, re- I really have discovered if we're going to be among group B, I don't want anything to do with that friend mm-hmm. while we're among group B because just sets everything on edge for me. Mm-hmm. But if we're going to be in group A, I'm really happy to see them. Really like them. Mm-hmm. So it requires that you follow some steps. And so, so we're going back to the zero premise again. The zero yeah. premise is I'm 60 years old and I live alone. Mm-hmm. So life has changed for me. And so now I'm isolated. I moved to a new city. I got no connections. What do I do about making friends? And what this article says is the first thing you have to do is make the assumption that people are going Mm -hmm. to like you, that there are likable things about you Mm -hmm. if you just put them out there. The second thing you have to do is exposure. You have to to find a place to go 
where people can encounter you, Mm -hmm. whether that's the grocery store or a church or a political action committee or a book club or whatever it might be. You need to find some little group or groups and regularly attend. Not just go once, but go consistently. And then when you're there, you have to contact people. You have to say, hi, I'm Brett Newcomb. Who are you? Where do you live? What's your phone number? Uh, Would you like to go to coffee at some point? You can't just show up and stand in the corner and say, well, they'll come to me if they come to me. You've got to work the soil. You've got to make the contact from the presumption that you're likable. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to be vulnerable. You Mm -hmm. have to say, I'm here because I'm looking for people to connect to. I'm here because I'm alone. I'm here because I've had a loss. I'm here because of... I'm looking for somebody to make me laugh, I, whatever it might be. I'm and here for an opportunity to have service. I, I think to... that ultimately yeah. that's the hardest part is the idea of being vulnerable. And I think the reason why we don't go and expose ourselves is because of the vulnerability. If we assume people don't like us, it's because we assume there are these things about us that people won't like. And what I would say to people, what I would say, what I do say to clients is, it is not a weakness to be vulnerable. It's actually a strength. Well, what I found to be the most successful route forward for me is to attach myself to someone like my wife, mm-hmm. who is much more socially adept and mm-hmm. flexible, to whom people are drawn, and just stand in her shadow. Mm-hmm. And then they, because they like her, they have to put up with me. Mm-hmm. As long as I don't create some faux pas that's of significance right that i'm tolerated yeah yeah and uh that works as long as your wife is around well yeah and so we're asking people to be willing to do this even if they well, don't what I'm have saying is, if i don't have one i need to go find somebody yeah. else that i can attach myself to and, and so it, it reduces the field down to one mm-hmm. if i find you and i become your good friend and your socially acceptable and popular, mm-hmm. then i can hang around you and by that connection can be included mm-hmm. and have opportunities to develop some other uh situations and i think that ultimately my message to anybody who's listening to this who says oh i'd like to have more friends but i just don't know how don't listen to this podcast (laughs) and then say okay well now i've got the template if you if you really feel that way then talk to somebody i mean you know pay a therapist to have a conversation with well, but you. Well, that's a, that's a conversation for next week. Next okay. week, we're going to talk about the difference between talking to a friend yeah, and yeah, talking well, to a therapist. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you listen to this and you think you have the blueprint plate, print the map, Yeah. <laughs> come back next week and see what you have to say. All right. So on that, I will say, uh, please get with us on social media. So like the page at Psych with Mike on Facebook and on Twitter and give us a message. Go to psychwithmike.com. Send us an, an email. And recognize at the end of the day, if it comes down to a choice between Michael and myself, I am the more appropriate choice because I'm so much more That's right. So when you send us an email, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to come to me. But if you put Brett's name on it, I will forward it to him and I won't even read it. Ah. (laughs) That's not true. I will read it. But the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. And if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike.